Good morning, everyone. And so this morning, we're looking at a topic that I decided to talk about this week. So this week, we're looking at different types of abuse, especially in the church. And as I delve into my um, project for my class, um, I know I've spoken about abuse before. and um, But this week, I want to unpack you know, devotion how abuse is affecting the church. And, you know, I want to start, I was going to start with emotional abuse, but this morning I'm going to start with spiritual abuse. And um, what are some of the values that enable church to hurt people? You see, spiritual abuse happens when a person with spiritual authority or power uses it as a leverage to exploit another person's trust and vulnerability to get what they want. And spiritual abuse is enabled in churches that have twisted value system and members who have twisted value system. And this definition came from Daniel McCoy. Okay, so we've seen many headlines in over the decades and in a current world where we see not just sex crime by pastors and elders and department leaders, but how the church has disregarded these victims and pastor admits affair and gets moved around and to somewhere else where he continues to perpetrate the same crime or it's swept on the carpet or someone get paid off depending on the church or the denomination involved. It's not hard to recognize these recurrent issues and church leaders who get away with bullying and insulting and intimidating people into complete submission and silence and members who force people into this arena where we say that you cannot take your brother to the unjust judge and the reputation of God and the church is at stake. So we ought to keep quiet as a church. Let me just tell you that God doesn't need any of us to defend his reputation and he can, it's more than capable of defending himself. And God doesn't take pleasure in his children being abused on no level in his church. A church member may express genuine concern about a pastor's doctrinal drifting, which the pastor construes as rebellion and black balls her to the congregation. Undiagnosed narcissistic personality disorders in the church leader is interpreted as commitment to the vision, and any dissent is castigated as spiritual unbelief. One of the saddest life situations we can imagine as a church is to be to have children growing up in unsafe place called their church home. To be abused by the parents that are in charge of them is one thing and it's sad, but to be sickening, to be abused in a place called church, their spiritual church home. And spiritual vulnerable people often their minds open their minds to truth and their hearts to healing, only to receive wounds in the deepest, hardest to heal places. And shepherds turn out to be wolves and sheep clothing. And yeah, let's leave there. What do we need to talk about? Spiritual abuse. The spiritual abuse in churches is, is a heavy topic. <laughs> and it needs a lot of unpacking, which time isn't permitted this morning. For any of us who love the church, it's uncomfortable to delve into how something we love is able to cause so much hurt to people. It's easy to want to move on to a happier topic when present church with um, in a better light. And we, but we urge to step over the issues and onto the next thing in the same temptation faces by the Levites of Jesus' time in the Good Samaritan case and the priests that passed by. It's a value system which says that my feeling comfortable is more significant and important than the victims that are hurting in our churches and not finding healing that they come to seek. A value system which says that our feelings comfortable in church is more important than those who are hurting among us. And that's where we got to acknowledge, you know, that this is a heavy topic that people who have suffered spiritual abuse in churches have a far deeper pain than those who experience the pain of delving into the issue were running from the mess of it. So for their sakes and the sake of, of future generation, we want to talk about it this morning. You see, 
what leads causes spiritual abuse and lead churches to spiritual abuse those who are entrusted in its care. So what is spiritual abuse? It's if I start with the abuse itself, what exactly is abuse? It's, it's a broad term meaning to harm or injure someone. A person can be abused in many ways and including physically and sexually and verbally and psychologically and financially. An abusive relationship is a relationship in which someone is exploiting their power and authority in the relationship to hurt the other person. Spiritual abuse can also be physical, it can be sexual, it can be verbal, and it can be financial. But it's done through a spiritual relationship. A person with spiritual authority or power is able to use that leverage to exploit another person's trust and vulnerability. Now, the person power dominates them in some way to get what they want. Now, a person with spiritual authority or power is able to use that leverage to exploit another person. Um, in a conversation, Tese Cannon, a survivor of spiritual abuse, explain the role that doctrine can sometimes play. You see, a person can wield religious doctrine in a way that abuses people. Now, an obvious way this can be done is through teaching false doctrine, which leads people to destruction, both in this life and the life to come. A, a more subtle way doctrine can abuse is when the doctrine itself may be biblical, but it's being used in an abusive, manipulative way, in the way women are treated in ministry, and they're allowed to come into ministry and are treated less than their male counterpart in work art. Now, that's a form of abuse. Um, we'll come on, there's a different type of abuse, which is for another day. For example, a spiritual leader might try to suppress or dissent by strategically planning a sermon series condemning gossip, or by pulling a verse from 1 Samuel 26, verse 9, out of context, who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless. And many of us suffer um, in the church silently because we sit in church and we say that um, we don't want to speak up because um, we say that this touch not the Lord anointed and we allow spiritual abuse to go by. So what spiritual abuse is not? It's a multifaceted and uh, spiritual abuse. It's, it's, it would be unfair to call any and every form of hurt that comes from a church spiritual abuse. Now, the plenty of scriptures can feel painful when we consider their implications on our lives, for example, verses of condemn sins and describe judgment. A hallmark of progressive Christianity is to intentionally interpret passages which have caused people hurt, whether the hurt it was caused by people misusing the scriptures or by people simply believing and teaching what the scripture means. It's is it spiritual abusive, for example, to teach that the Bible says about sexual ethics, knowing that it can be painful for people living outside biblical teachings to hear? No, that's not spiritual abuse. That's just the word of God, my friends. Now, Canon talk about a lot about spiritual abuse and the pain and the abuse of pain that comes with it. And she described two scenarios. She said she go to the dentist for a root canal and experienced discomfort from the procedure, that pain but it's not abusive. But if the dentist is poking you in that root canal continuously for because he gets a thrill or a pleasure out of it, then that is abusive. In the same way, biblical doctrines can be offensive, but if taught in a biblical way, they are for or good. And abuse happens when a person wields biblical doctrine or spiritual authority to manipulate the members or those in his care or her care and dominate and deflect or direct the narrative in his or her favor and persons wield this power, whether it's meant to inflate their egos or gratify their lust or, or, or protection or reputation. So King Pennington, PhD in Christian Ethics and Philosophy of Religion from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary on the topic of spiritual abuse states that, call it what it is, are you having a disagreement with someone? That's not spiritual abuse. Watch for long-term patterns of behavior. For Pennington, listening to Christianity Today podcast, the rise and fall of Marisville was a healing experience as she was able to relate to patterns she had experienced at various times throughout her years in ministry. She finally admitted that she had been spiritually abused and there was such a release and it's important to call it what it is. It's also needed to acknowledge that sometimes a person is forced to accuse of abuse. Destroying a person's reputation is to, to one kind of murder. And we do well to remember that a false witness who pours out lies is one of the seven things that God hates in, in, in the Bible. 
And, and we've got to see truth diligently or else we are in danger of ignoring spiritual abuse and believing false accusation, both of which are heartbreaking and devastating. What makes spiritual abuse so poisonous? You see, if it were only to the psychological and physical wound, the spiritual abuse should already be one of the top vices we hate and protect against. But there are also external ramifications when come, someone injects poison where a person opens themselves to receive goodness and truth. Negligent and abusive shepherds make God especially angry. The word of the Lord calls son of man prophesy against the shepherd of Israel prophesy and say to them this is what the sovereign Lord says woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves should not shepherd take care of their flock you eat the curds clothe yourselves with the wool and slaughter the choice animals but you do not take care of the flock you have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up their injured you have not brought back strays or search for the lost you have ruled them harshly and brutally so they have scattered because they was no shepherd and when they were scattered they became food for all the wild animals My sheep wandered over all the mountains and on every hill. They were scattered over the whole herd and no one searched or looked for them. Ezekiel 34 verse 1 to 6. You have not brought back the strayed or search for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. God summarizes his anger with the words that should frighten any spiritual abuser to their core. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherd and will hold them accountable for my flock. Ezekiel 34 verse 10. But what makes spiritual abuse so possible? Every person reading this knows that spiritual abuse is wrong. Protecting pastors who sexually abuse their members, especially children, is wrong. Tolerating ministers and leaders who bully and intimidate is wrong. It's wrong to silence whistleblowers and excommunicate abuse victims and disregard suspicious patterns and and the name of the person being called. But knowing these things are wrong doesn't go very far in preventing them. So long as we have value system that enable them, what do I mean? When church prioritize only A, B, and C, we end up not seeing or not really caring when there's a problem with D, E, F, G, H, I, to Z. If we want to make our churches a place where spiritual abuse can't find a home, we need to make sure our values are in the right order. So here are some of the things that get twisted when church become abusive. When we um, enable spiritual abuse, when we value charisma over character, by definition, it's basically impossible not to love charismatic people. They're the leaders whose contagious enthusiasm wins or buy in for bigger and better kingdom endeavors. And charisma is a wonderful thing when a pastor knows how to call the words and pronounce them properly and sway the audience. And the problem is not charismatic leaders. The problem is when we prioritize charisma over character. It's when we confuse giftedness with godliness. And this psychologist Pennington continued to tell us that America looks too much at charisma. And it's a spread over the world that whether the person is gifted leader and speaker, those tend to be the highest things we value and how many persons they baptize. And as opposed to the character traits laid out in scripture, if you are a charismatic person in leadership who is able to lead and charm and persuade and bring the numbers in, and then the person also turns out to be manipulative and abusive it's very hard to hold that person accountable. When the per church prioritizes a person's likability and ability to get results over the person's character, we are creating a situation where mm-hmm. spiritual abuse can happen and we may not even notice or care enough to put a stop to it. We enable spiritual abuse when we value the institution over the individual. So some churches and religious organizations fight so hard to cover up abuse scandals and hush up the victims, and it's because they are valuing the reputation of their institution over the well-being of their members and the hurting community. It's a subtle seduction too. As he just asks himself, what will happen to the cause of Christ? No, nothing to do with Christ. Their own reputation, it is get out. God can defend himself. That could well be a cover for the real question they won't ask out loud. What will happen to our institution if this gets out? What will it make us leaders out to be? The best questions 
are the ones it's easy not to ask. What can we do for the people who are hurting? And what will happen to the cause of Christ in future decades if we do nothing today about the abuse that's going on in church? What will happen to the cause of Christ if we cover this up? A church throwing individuals under the bus to preserve the institution's reputation is a bit like spiritual Stalinism, sacrificing individuals for the glorious good of humanity. Number three, we name spiritual abuse when we value advancement over accountability. You see, kingdom advancement is a good thing, but when we value it over accountability for leaders, when we set a time off for the leader to... Sorry, when we, we someday detonate the kingdom progress, that we've, we've helped build. There's a cultic celebrity-centeredness in, 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 in the church, some churches which enchants us to forget some of the biggest basics of our faith and the word of God. God is God and everyone's a sinner and we need the church to understand that. In fact, the person selling millions of books or speaking in front of tens of thousands probably need accountability more than the next guy. Do we really think that Satan and his demons are going to go easy on him because he's a well-known Christian leader? Do we really suppose that because this name is gold on a conference main stage of a publishing contract that he's immutable and he cannot have conceit and greed? And this is a need for accountability for it's closer to home when we, we talk about our leaders and especially in small churches that this ego and the size of a continent and a spiritual hunger, people feeding on your, your every word and, and, and the pastors elevated and the elders and oftentimes they're abusing their wives and their children. And, and because they come to church looking so nice and, and, and good, we ignore the fact that they are beating their wives and living double lives and, and, and they're not good leaders and having affairs with the youth and children and the church. And this is why church leadership was always meant to be a plurality with character traits such as above reproach and faithful to his wife and self-controlled and heading up the list of non-negotiable qualification in First Timothy chapter three and faithful to their husbands and, 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 and to their families. And we enable spiritual abuse when we value muscle over weak meekness. You see, meekness is, isn't weakness. It's having strength, but keeping it under control. It's the ability to mow over the whole yard and tulips and tomato plants included, but choosing to mow only the grass. It's, it's a decision to choose words of grace amid feelings of frustration. And church leaders need this for those situations in which they could exploit people's spiritual vulnerability over their own gratification. And the New Testament scholar Michael Kruger um, very helpfully points us to four scriptures, which is easy to miss when we are prioritizing muscles and strength to move things along over weaknesses, the ability to control that strengthen so it doesn't hurt people. In 1 Timothy 3 verse 3, it says, now the overseer is to be not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, but a lover of money. Verse 25 verse 3, be shepherds of God's flock, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being example to the flock. In Matthew 20 verse 25 and 26, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high official exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. In 2 Timothy 2 verse 24, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. I hope you catch a description of the biblical leadership taught by Jesus and Paul and Peter. Not violent, but gentle, not lording it over, but being examples of the flock. Servant, not quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. If we want churches which don't give spiritual abuse a foothold, we will be impressed with meekness over masses. Repentance and resolve is easy to read an article and nod and say, these are good points of leaders. And this is especially the case if you personally or your local church hasn't been affected by the problems of spiritual abuse. But the problem is probably bigger than any of us actually aware. I want to encourage you to take what 
we'll be discussing and to look into your church and look at the people who are hurting and how can we make a change? How can leaders in a church, you know, um, and self-reflect and how can we put checks and balance in place? And we're too allowing in church, we're, we're too open. We allow our children to roam all over the place in the name of their children, unattended and open up to abuses in the church. We're too trusting sometimes in the wrong areas and we're not self-aware or diligent in doing our checks on those we place in charge of our churches and exposing our members to various levels of spiritual abuse. Okay, so how do we reconcile when there's something go wrong? When there's a damaged relationship, instead of being authentic and bringing it into the forefront, we tend to cover it up or try to dilute it and we don't face the reality and we spiritualize certain things in church. And these are some of the breathing ground of spiritual abuse. I don't want to be long this morning, so I'm going to stop here. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you have called us, Lord, to care for each other, to love the Lord God with all our hearts and to love our neighbors at ourselves. But Lord, we are so abusive to each other and we justify the abuse. And your church is the breathing ground for abuse, Lord. And your church open up the can of form and we are silent and we commit the sin of omission, Lord, by allowing it to exist in, in the name of spiritually and protecting the organization. And this week, as we explore the various abuse in your house, Lord, Father, I pray, God, that you will touch our hearts and we will be advocates, Lord, for the helpless, because you're going to ask us, Lord, you're going to ask us, what have we done? How did we speak up and advocate against the spiritual injustice in your church? In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed day. I know this is a difficult topic, but we've got to talk about these things. We've got to talk about these things. Have a blessed week.